have the uh, the anthem people of the church that would be great yeah I'm still here we uh, had an interesting week this week but I guess what uh, what I've really enjoyed seeing is the the way that uh, the church, and I'll use that as Grace Baptist Church for now, the church can come along beside people who are hurting. Uh, many of you might have known that uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, David Rickett, passed away uh, and did his memorial on Monday and then uh, went to the gravesite on Tuesday. Um, that memorial is one of the the most powerful ones I've been a part of, just to hear the testimony of not only people who follow Christ, but even people who don't, who recognize the character of a man that exemplified everything that I want to be. Uh, but just to watch the church gather around this family in a difficult time, you know, to see a man leave a little 10, 11 year old son who did a beautiful job praying for his dad in the memorial service uh, and sat there at the grave side while the casket was being lowered with his arm around his mother who was completely, completely undone. Um, and, and, but more importantly, just to see believers come around this family and, and uh, it, it's a beautiful thing just to know that, that uh, we, we truly do draw strength from one another. There's, there's, one another. there's, there's, there's strength in those numbers. Uh, but that's not our strength. I believe it's God's strength, and I believe He gives it when we need it. Um, and uh, it's interesting as I as I considered this song we're going to start with tonight. Uh, it reminded me again of truly when we are held by Christ, when we are held by God, when when God chooses to do whatever God's going to do, uh, people step out of the way. Uh, if they need to. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, God promised Israel saying, if you will be careful to do all the commandment uh, that I give to you, loving the Lord your God and walking in His ways and holding fast to Him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you and, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves. Uh, he says, no one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. And the biblical record kind of proves that out, that uh, nobody is going to stand against God's anointed, especially as you see it, if you remember the story in Esther where, where Haman's trying to destroy Mordecai and all the people of Israel. And... Uh, but Esther stands in the gap and Haman's plan is found out and they go, they go and hang him. And then it says, the Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces to lay hands on those who sought their harm and no one could stand against them for the fear of them had fallen on all the people. That's God, right? That's God. And that's exactly what he promised. Of course, you remember the, the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira. Didn't take much to cast fear into people when they start carrying people out dead who say one thing and do another. Um, I'm glad God doesn't seem to work that way as much anymore. Uh, well, when it says a great fear fell upon the church, I, I believe it. I believe it. That happened in one of our church services. How much did you give this week? Um, <laughs> But it's not, just, it's not just the fear. I think it's favor. And that's one of the things that I hope that the church will recognize. Because in the book of Acts, and you're familiar with chapter 2, it says, all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And then this, this line that really stands out, and having favor with all the people. Not just people in the church, with all the people. So the fact that they ate together, they hung out together, they were generous to one another, they did everything they could for one another, that made a difference. And I, I guess I'm just, I was just kind of dwelling on that as I spent this week with, with uh, various people who were drawing strength 
uh, from, from the church. And it makes me, it, it really made me pray that and we as Grace Baptist Church would recognize what it is that people see in us that would actually draw God's favor out of them, that they would actually see God is among them, because the church is at risk of losing that kind of identity. In fact, in my mind, the very fact that the church has been somewhat impotent in days like this, and not important, impotent, mm -hmm. um, is that we have lost some of that. In fact, I think we've seen so much infighting, denominational infighting, you know, just you're wrong, you're wrong, no, you do this, no, you do this, that, that I think that the, all the people stand just looking at it, well, why would we want to be a part of that, right? Um, I think not only is there infighting within the church at large, I'm not talking about grace now, necessarily, uh, but I think a lot of people just struggle speaking the name of Jesus, you know, and it's, and it's so condemned in so many places, no, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that that I think the church is starting to believe that I can't do that. And G Jesus made it obvious, didn't he? I mean, he said, if you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before the Father. That was, that was very clear. I don't want to deny him. I don't want church to deny him. There's one thing to say, you know, certain settings are not necessarily a setting where we're preaching the gospel, but we can certainly live it. But there's... When, when people start telling you you can't say the name of Jesus, that starts to cross a line we've got to be careful of. We've got to really look carefully at those things. I think the church also struggles with relying upon man's ingenuity and sometimes man's goals rather than God's goals because um, the church is, is in many cases trying to emphasize just attraction. Let's just get them in the door. The church oftentimes values growth over discipleship. Sometimes the church exalts speakers and musicians over exalting the Lord and their Savior Jesus. There are people, there are speakers that are more famous than Jesus is. And I believe that's the church's fault. The church must exist to make disciples, uh, as the song says, who magnify his greatness and declare that he alone is God. And, and so I, I want to be sure that when we are singing this song that it, it touches something inside of you. It's because the song itself is rather simplistic and the kids are going to be in it and it's kind of fun and all that. But to me, it has extreme importance. The message has extreme importance to the church today. Because Proverbs 19 says, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. If Grace Baptist is going to stand... <coughs> It's going to be God's purposes that we need to be exalting, not our own. Not trying to grow this church. We'll let God take care of growth. We need to disciple one another. We need to make those disciples. And he promised to help us do just that, right? Because God's purpose is to reconcile men to himself. God's purpose is to change hearts. God's purpose is to conform us in the image of his son and to prepare us for the life to come. We got, we got to make sure that what we're not believing is that my best life, as some preachers very famous would say, is now. If it is, God help us. Right? I mean, just look at the political climate right now, right? Romans 8, here's what God promised. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he will also glorify. That's a promise to God. You see what he's doing? He's getting you ready for the next life. Not this one, the next one. That was about the only thing I could say to these people. When a 50-year-old you know, man is taken away by lung cancer, he's never smoked, he's an athlete of oh, the whole thing. Okay? <laughs> How could God let it happen? Well, about the, the reason God lets things like that happen is because this isn't what he's getting us ready for. And if he feels we're ready to come on <laughs> into his kingdom at 50 as opposed to 70 or 80 or 90 or whatever it happens to be, that's, that's totally up to him. But that's when he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, and that's what's behind this song, folks. If, if we're going to stand, we're only standing because God is for us. And believe me, He is for us. 
he who did not spare his own son, Paul goes on to write in Romans, but gave up, uh, gave up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who's going to condemn you? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I mean, that's, that's a guarantee you and I can, can really sink our teeth into. Now, battles obviously are going to come. The spiritual enemy that we have is real, all right? And we won't win every battle, but we know the war has already been won. The battles are going to be fierce. They always are. So what are we supposed to do with that? Well, first of all, we need to remain in Christ. That is it. No matter what, you remain in Christ. How do you do that? Well, Paul said in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand, right? So when we're up there singing this song, you know, of who can stand against us, we need to recognize that just about anybody can, unless you're standing in Christ, unless it is your daily habit to put on the armor of God. And I think some of the, the more important parts of that we're also singing about in this thing. One is that we kneel praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication as part of the armor is that we're praying regularly another part of that armor is standing in truth we're living in obedience to god we hear the truth we respond to it in obedience psalm 119 says great peace have those who love your law nothing can make them stumble right finally we need to live in love. All these are lines in this anthem. We need to live in love. The important balance in the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. But love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That's, <laughs> that, it's an equal thing. Right? Equal kind of love. It's not just understanding the Bible. It's living it out in love. That's why... Paul writes, and I keep going back to it, I could have all the powers, I could understand all the mysteries, I could have all knowledge of the Bible, and I could have the greatest faith of all, all faith, that I could move mountains. But if I don't love, I don't have anything. It's more than just knowing, folks. And that's critical for us. Because I could, you could be as generous as you want, you could invite as many people as you want over to your house. But if you have not love, <laughs> you don't have anything. And that's, that's something we need to be uh, just thinking about. Because if we do those things, then we can rest in that. Then we can know that God is going to be working through us to perfect us, to protect us. And in that, <coughs> nothing can stand against us. And that's really what I want for Grace Baptist. I really want this to be a place. Not that we're just a bunch of smart people who know the Bible. But we're about much smart people who love people and love God because of what we know in the Bible. There's a big difference in that, right? So let's let's sing this song together. Let's find out if we can hear something a little different in the midst of all of that. <laughs>